My wife's not here tonight. Uh, my in-laws are coming to the town tomorrow. My birthday is tomorrow, and my father-in-law's birthday is also tomorrow. We were born on the same day, yes. And uh, my annual present is in-law visitations. <laughs> And when you get into your 60s or 50s, actually, birthdays don't, ooh. In fact, uh, you kind of dread them. It's when I was a kid, it was, I was happy about it. Couldn't wait to get older. What an idiot. Now I wish I could go back. Oh, stop. All right, well, anyway, our Gifts of the Spirit seminar... Uh, before Arnie cut my mic off, was here. <laughs> it's the gifts of the Spirit. That's coming up. That's coming up fast, real quick. A couple weeks there. That'll be a fun. That's always a fun seminar. Cause everybody, that's a good topic. Everybody's happy with that. No one sends me negative emails. Here's my radio programs. I'm now on every day of the week and on weekends. Uh, my SoundCloud.com. Slash Hardcore Christianity is changing at the end of March, starting in April. It'll be on a different server. Doesn't matter. You can still pick it up off the website. Uh, as uh, Karina said, our healing room is tomorrow from 9 to 3. The first two were booming. Woo! Literally. Woo! I mean, man, one person after the other. <clears throat> My goal is to have the largest healing room in the state right. by the end of the year. And... I'm looking to recruit uh, workers to help us with those if they're going to keep growing and uh, we're getting a lot of people coming in. We need more help for those. So just something for you to keep in mind. Maybe you can help us out praying for the sick. That would be great. Every, the first two services were great. Amen. Bunch of deliverances, bunch of healings right down the line on both. So I'm expecting the same thing tomorrow. Right. And uh, if there's a lot of healing and deliverances, that would be my birthday present for tomorrow, All right. because All right. you know, my second birthday present, my first one is uh, my in-law visitation, so that's right. Oh, the, uh, if you want to help us out and you don't have any money, you can help us, switch from Google to Good Search and put in our uh, charity name, and then they'll pay us when you surf the web. If you use Amazon and you buy anything on Amazon, you can still help us, they'll pay us 0.5% uh, Oh, that's wrong, 1.2, it's 0.5%, apologize for that. Every time you buy something off Amazon. So if you go to amazonsmile.com instead of amazon.com and just click on our ministry, they will pay us 0.5% of whatever you buy. So let's say you buy a $45,000 vehicle. So there would be a 0.5% of that would then come over here. We'll use the money for food, for the healing house, utilities, summer's coming, whatever we, whatever we use it for. Uh, none of it is used for salaries. Nobody takes a salary, including my wife and I. We're all uh, what you call volunteers. Okay, so all the money that comes in the ministry goes right in the ministry. With the exception, I do have a yacht fund that I'm putting... <laughs> We have four YouTube teaching channels, and uh, you got a whole bunch of good stuff on there. All of our uh, services, Thursdays and Fridays, are uh, on the internet. Live stream Thursday night, tonight, our YouTube channel. This uh, list is causing all kinds of problems and healing all kinds of people. It's, it's a mixed bag. Uh, if you want to get the miracle list, just send me an email, and they work. Got a bunch of testimonies on the website right there. Don't forget about your terror cell at your church. You are to open up a secret terror cell to terrorize the devil and start picking off sick people in your church. If you go to a mega church, that's the best, that's the best place to get them because you never run out of sick people at a mega church. There's hundreds of them literally every Sunday, hundreds of emotionally, mentally, and physically ill people go to mega churches, they never get healed, and they're waiting for you, YouTubers, you open up your terror cell at your church, pick them off on the side. Do it gently. Uh, don't don't uh, do it in front of everybody like some of our people have done. 
Uh, then they get thrown out too quickly. Don't forget about your donations. The miracle boxes are on the door, and uh, the doors are now hermetically sealed. That's the only one you can get out of. These are all permanently locked until you donate. And then you can also donate on the website, which we appreciate. We use that money to pay bills. You need a receipt for last year? I just sent another one out today. Send me an email. I'll see you Thursday, next Thursday, in Emporia, Kansas, at the Church of God of Prophecy. Whatever that is, okay? We're going to have a healing service there in Kansas. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk to you for a minute. In America, the gospel's changing. And obviously it's changing because of technology. And the system's also changing quite a bit. And it has to change because down the road, I think within a few years, the Antichrist and the false prophet will rise. The Antichrist out of the Middle East, the false prophet, God only knows where he comes from. There's nothing in the Bible about him. He just, bang, appears. And so the planet and the churches are being prepped or arranged by Satan for this future tribulation period. And what's happening is... Uh, Christianity is changing. Uh, now you've got kind of two ways it's going. This one here is, is, is the uh, worldwide method. And the best one to look at there is Hillsong. Have you ever heard of that church? They're, they're out of Australia. <clears throat> and what they're doing is they're, they have a main pastor there. And then they open churches all over the planet. And then on Sunday morning, they pipe in the main pastor to the services all over the world, every different service. And then they, have, then they have local kind of pastors to manage each little group on their satellite system. And the idea here is to make the gospel seem fun and palatable and make it so that it's all-inclusive. Okay? The true gospel, which I'll show you in a minute, is an exclusive. Yes. It's the gospel of exclusion. The phony gospel, the, the commercial gospel, is a gospel of inclusion. We want everybody in. Everybody come in and have a good time. And we like all of you. God loves you. And, you know, if you got some weird beliefs, don't worry about it. We'll work it out at the church picnic. This system here is e much easier to indoctrinate people with this insane gospel that's coming down the pipe. The Hillsong and the, the Mars Hill and all these other groups, they are high-tech professionals. And they have entertainment and visuals and audio. You can't even believe it. I mean, it's awesome. And the idea is to... Give everybody an entertaining, feel-good experience at church and get you to come back. Correct? Because as you know, in the general public, uh, public, the general public, in every career field, every person is considered a unit of revenue. That's correct. At Walmart, you walk in the door, you aren't a human being, you're a potential unit of revenue. They want you to buy something. You go to the church, you're basically a unit of revenue. You have a potential to donate funds into their system. Okay? So the theory being, and it works, the more people I get in this system, potentially, percentagely, you have more money coming in. It's simple mathematics. The other system here is, is also huge. You have the mega church here, and then the mega church has a main pastor, and then they start opening satellite churches. So this pastor is at this church, but they also have pastors at these churches. So they don't pipe in this pastor to that church. These pastors are indoctrinated in this system. Then they go out individually and start satellite churches. 
So here in Phoenix, for example, Christ Church of the Valley up here, but they have satellite churches all over the valley. You know, Phoenix First Assembly, I think they changed the name to Dreamville. Now they've got... <laughs> Now they've got, they're doing the same thing. Everybody, all these mega churches are doing the same thing. And then these churches then, again, working on the units of revenue, peel off a percent to the main hub or the main uh, mega church. <coughs> and the whole theory is what we've got to do here is make you feel good so that you will come back feeling entertained, feeling uplifted, feeling encouraged. Party on, dude. Come back, because everybody who walks through the door, Walmart, Target, whatever it is, church, is a potential unit of revenue. Now, obviously, everybody's not a unit of revenue, but they're playing the odds. It's a percentage move, correct? Some people go into Walmart, they look at something, they walk out, they buy nothing. Yeah, you always have a percent of people who don't donate or don't buy anything. So that's how that system works. That is not the gospel of Christ. It has nothing to do with it. I'll show you how it works today. Here's how the Lord set the system up originally, and this is how it's supposed to work. Right? Let's, let's take a quick trip through Acts 13. So it says, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch. And they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. No problem. A very common occurrence. Saturday afternoon, that's when the Jews had church. Correct? And then it says, after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, what they would do in the synagogues was 12 months Jewish calendar year. And then January, we're going to read this much of the Torah, and that much, and that much, and that much, and, then, and it was read every Saturday, and then by the end of the year, theoretically, it's the read through the Bible thing, like Protestants have. So they would go through the reading of the Torah, and there was no moving of the Spirit, no power of God. It was all mental, some emotional, and they would just read and believe. Read, believe, read, believe. That's how the system works. And they would do that all year. And the next year they would start over like that. So here, now they're reading the, the law, the Torah. And then they would go to the prophets right down through the year. And uh, one of the uh, ministers in the church says, hey, if anybody has anything to say, well, say on. And here's how it worked back then. Uh, we can't do that now because that's been politically correct, but the, the real Jews would, let's say, be in this section and that section, and then the proselytes would be in that section. So the regular Jews, the real Jews, they got to sit together, and then the proselyte Jews sat over there. In America, we had that back in the 30s and 40s and so on. You have your white people sitting over here, then you had your black people over there. Any old people here? Nobody? Okay, well, anyway, just take my word for it. That's how the system used to work before you were born. You would have whiteies over here, crackers and honkies, then you had blacks over here, okay? And then they were separate, okay? And then some ministers came along, and they said, we're not going to do that. That's a sin. And great preachers like Whitfield, Billy Graham, who just died, they wouldn't segregate their services like that, and that caused a lot of problems. Everybody got a little PO'd, and that's how that system worked. Well, they had the same thing there. Jews were here, and converted Jews were here. They were second-class citizens because they were born Greeks and from all kinds of areas, and they converted to Judaism. So somebody who uh, saw the idol-worshiping system as a farce, then they... They, they read the, about Judaism and, and Yahweh and so on. They said, hey, that's, that sounds like the real God. I'm going to convert from this false God to Judaism. And they were called proselytes. But they weren't allowed to sit with the Jews. They were proselyte Jews. They were second-class citizens. You got to sit over there, very similar to Rosa Parks, 
where you, years ago you, the blacks had to sit in the back of the bus, so to speak. No offense. And Paul stands up and says, hey, you know, uh, people who are filled with the Holy Ghost, if somebody hands them an opportunity, they're the first people to grab it. People with fear demons, they'll sit quietly in their seat, and then an internal debate goes on in their head. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I say something? I don't know. Is it God's will? Is it, what is it? Say, if you have to get ready to do something when the opportunity presents itself, you're already lost it. Quoting Wigglesworth. Stole it from Wigglesworth. He said, if you've got to prepare yourself to do something when the opportunity is there, you've already missed it. Every time they asked Wigglesworth to do something, the answer was always yes. Paul, same way. Hey, you got something to say? But he stands up. There he goes. Men of Israel and you that fear God, Jews, proselytes. Jews, proselytes. He's talking to both groups. Listen to me, he says. God, the God of Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the lands of Egypt. And with a high arm, he brought them out. Amen. About the time of 40 years, he suffered their manners. Ha! Boy, I'll tell you what, that manners thing transferred from Judaism to Christianity, didn't it? You ever talk to a bunch of Christians with rotten manners? Oh, you have no idea. I get them in my office all the time, and they say just about anything in the world to me. Well, these Jews, that, that's the way they were. They had no manners. They would run their mouth like a busted chainsaw. And Jehovah used to fume at them. It was called what? Murmuring. Thank you. Murmuring. Very bad. And when he destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided the land by lot to the Jews. Correct? There were 12 sections of it. Benjamin got their lot last. And here's the seven uh, groups that Jehovah wiped out to give their land to the Jews, and that is what we call uh, Palestine now. Correct? This is all mentioned in Joshua chapter 13 through chapter 22 if you want to read about it. But anyway, Jehovah displaced these idol worshipers, and he gave the Jews this land because of his relationship and his agreement with Abraham. They were friends and partners, and he had made promises to Abraham. And when Jehovah, the great Hebrew God, makes a promise, he is not able to go back on it. Amen. He's stuck. If you can get him to give you a promise, he's stuck, and he has to go come through with it. He can't take it back. It's impossible. If you can get him to say yes, he's on the hook. Well, anyway, these Canaanites, the Hittites, the whatever they are, the Rectolites, all these things, they all got booted out. And the Jews took over Palestine, or the land of Israel, correct? And then after that, he gave judges about 450 years until Samuel. And then they wanted a king. So then they went into the king system. And Saul was a king next, he says, about 40 years. And then when God removed him for disobedience... Paul says he raised up King David, the greatest king of Israel. And then he says, uh, Jehovah said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now he's given them the history of Israel. So the Jews are all going, yeah, that's right. I'm with you. We're on that game. The proselytes are all going, yeah, that's great. That's interesting. Oh, keep going. Uh, Brother Paul, he's got their attention now, see, he's, he knows how to preach and teach. He's, he was the best at it. And then it says, uh, again, we're still in Acts 13. Of this man's seed has God, according to his promise, raised to Israel a Savior, Yahshua, or Jesus, he says to them. Now, what's going to happen is the sermon gets nasty. It gets uninclusive. In this demonic system of fanny padding and pleasure seeking, this is an inclusion system. Everybody welcome. The true gospel is an exclusion system. It's an exclusion system. Now Paul's in deep trouble. He's talking to the Jews. He's not in trouble over here. He's talking to the proselytes.
Now he's, now he's in trouble. He mentions Jesus. And then when John first preached, now he goes to John the Baptist. Now he wants to build his case very much like a lawyer would build his case. He goes to evidence. Here's some evidence that you will, you will know about. And he was, they would all have heard of John the Baptist. And they said, hey, here's John the Baptist. He preached the gospel of repentance. And now he's in trouble again. Because once you bring repentance into this system, the units of revenue start leaving or jumping ship. So you can't be hard on these people because your customer, they're gone. Paul doesn't care about this system. He only cares about what's true. Yes, yeah. Paul was, by our standards, sick in the head. <laughs> As John fulfilled his course, he said, who do you think I am? Is it, am I the Messiah? No, John says, I am not the Messiah. He's using John now to point to his main subject here that he's trying to sneak up on him with. It is Yahshua, or Jesus, the Son of the God, living God. And John, and John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. So these people, proselytes, Jews in the synagogue, they all, many of them were very respectful of John and had a high opinion of him. So Paul is now kind of roping John in to help set up his main argument coming here in just a second. When men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, men and brethren, proselytes, children of the stock of Abraham, Jews. He's got a mixed crew here. Correct? He's talking to two groups. He says, and whoever of you among you who fears God, proselytes, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Oh, now he's in deep trouble. See? He's not doing this system here where you kiss everybody's brass ring. Now he's going with the truth, and he doesn't care who likes it. Now he's saying something that could get him killed. What do you mean salvation? The Jews are thinking. We're already saved. Hey, we come in here every week, Saturday. We're reading the Torah. We're going through the prophets. We've got the word of God. What do you mean we're not? What's saved? Save what? What are you on crack? What's going on here? The proselytes are going, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, let me, hmm, that's a, yeah, keep going there. What are you talking about salvation? Because the proselytes felt like second-class citizens, and they were. They had to ride in the back of the bus. So what kind of a person you are determines how you hear the gospel and how you respond to it, as it is in our society today. They know there's so many jacked-up Christians out there that if you just keep it positive, fun, happy, peace, happiness, love, abundant life, and prosperity, you'll, you'll, more, you'll get more units of revenue in, and then you can pay the bills, buy the yachts, pay the big house, and you keep that system rolling as long as you can. And you don't want to lose any of your units of revenue to that other church over there. So you have to upgrade your programs, which is what Hillsong's done. They're blowing everybody away with this massive presentation of the entertaining gospel. You, you wouldn't believe it. Have you ever seen that? Any of that? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's Hollywood. Hardcore Hollywood. Amazing. Amazing. This isn't Hollywood. Here, this is, this is all truth. Okay? By our standards, Paul's cracked up. Now he's going on to dangerous ground here with a mixed group saying, you can be saved. I thought we were already saved. Well, the proselyte didn't feel like they were saved. Who would feel saved if you were a second-class citizen? That can't be all that much fun. Riding in the back of the bus gets old, and when they got on there, Rosa Parks apparently said, I ain't getting out of my seat. I'm tired of sitting in the back of the bus. I'm staying right here by the bus driver. That's how that went. That's my understanding. I wasn't there, but I mean, that's the story I read. Acts 13 still. And they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, 
nor did they know, know the voices of the prophets read every Sabbath, like this place. See what he's doing here? He's getting ready to hit them with hardcore Christianity. And hardcore Christianity is not the gospel of inclusion. It's the gospel exclusion. Excluding Allah and Buddha and Zoroaster and Mother Mary and every other false god in the planet Earth. It's the gospel of exclusion, not inclusion. Paul is about ready to get his butt caught in a ringer and he doesn't care because he's got the Holy Ghost. He's not into an entertainment blowhard system. All he cares about is the truth and he doesn't care who likes it. You better preach. Come on. Paul was nasty. Now he's stepping on it now and he's about to step in it. He says, hey, you read the prophets every sat Saturday, don't you? You weren't even listening to the prophets. Because they told you about Yahshua. Now he's really in trouble with this group. That group over there, the proselytes, they're going, whoa, keep preaching, brother. Does that make sense? They were second class. And they fulfilled the prophets, which you don't know, Jews, in Crino, judging him and condemning him to death. Crino means to evaluate, assess, render a verdict, and pass a judgment. Reading the evidence, coming to a conclusion, and sentencing him to death. That's what happened to him in the middle of the night when they had Jesus' trial. This is what he's referring to. And now, these are Jews, and some of them are going, hmm, I'm starting to get a little PO'd here. <laughs> They're calming themselves down. They're not doing anything yet. But you can tell by looking at people's faces when they're starting to get a little mad. If you've ever been married, you know what I'm talking about. You know how to read faces. Mm -hmm. And when somebody gets starting to get mad, you can kind of pick up on it. Well, they're starting to get steamed here. What do you mean? We read the law and the prophet. No, you didn't. You missed it. Nobody likes to be told they miss stuff. Though they found no cause, idea, valid reason for his death, and they desired Pilate that he should be slain. Translation, the Jews are unjust murderers. Half, now these are Jews, and there's the proselytes. I'm getting, Paul's getting amens from that section. He's getting odd looks from this one. Hmm. Wait Hmm. Might be called a murderer. When they fulfilled all that was written of him, he goes back to the prophets. They took him down from the tree and they laid him in a sepulcher. Translation, they buried him. Now, we don't actually know what happened back then because there were several different kinds of crosses that were used to crucify people. But, in my opinion, I think it was either... It was one of these three. I don't think it was that one because it says in the text that Pilate put a sign above his head. So my thought would be if his head was like here and his arms were there, you could still get a sign up there. You could easily get one up there and here, correct? So I don't think it was one of those crosses. But anyway, it doesn't matter. One of these crosses they murdered him on. It was called the tree. Zulon is a Greek word. It means tree tree, like a regular tree. Cross, the crosses were made out of trees. That's why they call them trees. Now Paul starts to go into the word of God. He says, but God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days, 40 exactly, and from all kinds of people who became his witnesses. Now he's telling them something unbelievable which back then is a vicious, nasty, hardcore sermon. Now it's a run of the mill. We have Christmas every year. The resurrection means nothing. We're all used to it. So here in America, no big deal. I've heard this story over and over again. Not a big deal. There, they had never heard that story before. 
And he was telling them that this dead Jew, Yahshua, rose from the dead. Now, nobody thinks anything of that. Back then, that was like earth-shattering material. Shocking. What do you mean he's not dead? you got to be kidding me. That's not possible. That's incredible. And he says there were witnesses to it. He was risen from the dead. He says, and we declare to you these glad tidings concerning the promises made to the Father. Now he's going to go back in the Old Testament and explain to the Jews here and the proselytes there that if you knew how to read the Bible correctly, you would have seen the promises of the Moshiach as clear as a bell, and you would have seen Jesus met those, that criteria to be the Messiah. So now he's going to use it as support, and then he says, Again, Jesus was raised from the dead. Not, a, not an interesting story now because we have it so much. Everybody hearing it over and over again. It's called systematic desensitization. Once you hear something over and over again, you become desensitized to it and it has limited to no effect on you. Here, these people are all on the edge of their seats. These people are on the edge, edge of their seats listening to him preach a sermon that they had never heard before, that was appeared to be stark, raving crazy to some, and an incredible miracle to others. This person was raised from the dead. That was a big deal back then. Okay? And then it says, he starts quoting the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 2, as it is written. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Now he's going a step further by saying this person, Yahshua, was actually the son of Jehovah. Now everybody is staring at him like they can't believe it. And then he quotes Psalm 18. He says, concerning that he raised him up from the dead, no more to corruption. He said on this wise, and he quotes Psalm 18, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Why? Because of all these promises in the Old Testament that applied to Jesus, and now he's putting it all together for him. He's like wrapping it up in a nice little package. It's fantastic. Like Christmas. <laughs> then he quotes Psalm 16, and he says, Wherefore, he said, you shall not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. See, the Bible says, Jews, proselytes, that the Son of God was predicted to be raised from the dead. In America, you get the same reaction I just got from you. You're just staring at me. Back then, they're not reacting that way. That is that's off the hook. Incredible news. Okay. David, after he had served in his own generation by the will of God, died. Whoa. Now he's, now he's saying that the person they loved the most, King David and Moses, he says, they're dead. Your favorite people are dead. Jews are going, what's the point he's going to make out of that? These proselytes are going, yeah, preach on, Brother Paul. Mm -hmm. They want to hear this message. They love it. And then it says, they died and they rotted in the grave. And in fact, everybody dies and rots in the grave unless you get cremated. Then you rot in your urn. And they charge you for the urns. They give them back to you. Now, if you have an urn and from somebody, please get that out of your house. When somebody dies, uh, their spirits leave that body. And then they go to other family members. So if you bring home the urn, it's kind of like waving a flag at them. Put grandma in the garage or sprinkle her at sea or her favorite 
vacation spot, whatever, and get that, my recommendation, this isn't from God, it's just me, based on my experience, you get, kind of get that thing out of your house. There. Yeah. That would be my recommendation. Well, anyway, all of your heroes, Jews, are dead, and they rotted in the grave. But, he whom God raised from the dead, okay, that's no news here, but back there, that was shocking news. They had never heard anything like it. Somebody was raised from the dead? Yeah. In fact, he never, he never saw any corruption. He was only in the grave three days. So his body never even rotted like King David and Moses and Joshua and all the rest of them. This person, he says, is whom I'm preaching to you. Then he drops the bomb and says, that's how you get your sins forgiven. What? The Jews are freaking. Wait a minute. The way we get our sins forgiven, we come into the Saturday and we read the, out of the Tanakh, and then we read out of the prophets, then you sacrifice animals, and that's how you get saved. See? And Jehovah is your Savior. Whoops. Boop. No. No. That's not how it works anymore. Okay? They did not have the reaction you just gave me, sitting there staring at me. Now the groom is starting to rumble. Now, Brother Paul is either going to hit a Grand Slam home run or end up hanging like Judas. Now, but he doesn't care because he doesn't belong to this kiss your butt system and make some. Rip. All he cares about is what's true. Amen. By our standards, he was mentally ill. God raised him from the dead, and this person who did not was raised from the dead, and he's alive now and never saw corruption like King David, he is the one that can forgive you of your sins. These scriptures, YouTubers, I thought I'd put them down there for you, show that the gospel is a gospel of exclusion, not inclusion, like they have in Hillsong and the groups. It's Christ only, and there is no other way to be saved or go to heaven. No other God, no other religion, no other philosophy, no other the concept, no other person. That's it. Period. Jews, there's a new sheriff in town. The old system that you have been living under your whole life and your fathers lived under and your grandfather, everybody lived under that system has now been changed. Amen. That's right. Amen. Then he keeps going. How does he do it? I have no idea. By him, all that believe are the guy. Athenai. Listen, that's a past tense uh, verb, meaning that when you come to Christ, you are instantly justified, instantly justified, and the word justification means you are declared innocent or not guilty. Whoa, wait a minute, Jews... Now that now a few people have messed their pants. Nope, now the bladders are going. Wait a minute. We got the Tanakh. We have the prophets. We have the Old Testament. We have what well, the way to be right with God is to sacrifice an animal. That's the atonement. And God covers our sin for us. And that's how we do it. Boop! Whoa! Wrong! Thrown out. You mean everything I've done and my granddad and my great-granddad, everybody 
Now it's all thrown out. Now this message isn't going to excite you tonight, but if you were sitting in that synagogue and you were a proselyte or you were a, a Jew, you would be stunned hearing this story. Stunned. Shocked to death. Eh? In this kind of a routine here, you expect to get a good show. How, you want to worship the Lord through a laser light experience? Hallelujah! You want to get party on, dude. If you don't like that, you go to the prophetics. Oh, that's fun. Gold dust, minerals falling out of the ceiling, feathers in your face. Woo! Entertainment. Party with Jesus. This ain't a party with Jesus. This is a declaration of war. Everything you believed, Jews, has now been changed. Hundreds of them stood up, screaming, Elizabeth, I'm coming home. They're so <laughs> the Chiophany, you're justified once and for all in the past when you come to Christ. And then he says, from what? All things. All things, not under the law. If you did some things, you got stoned. If you slept with another man's wife, stoned. If you stole an ox, you had to pay him back five oxes. If you stole a goat, you had to pay him back four goats. Oxen were more valuable than goats. In case you're a farmer. <laughs> but now that system's removed. Wow. Now any sin you committed, no matter what it was, yes. that person who was dead and rose from the dead, he forgives you of your sins. Yes. What? Hey. Now, the old law, you could not be justified. Duh. The coyote. Now he talks present tense justification. That's right. <coughs> Every year, the high priest had to go in to the Holy of Holies to forgive the sins of the whole nation. But it had to be done every year. The whole system of these Jews was now being replaced right in front of their eyes. Because you could never be justified through the law of Moses. It doesn't work. Paul had what we call big <laughs> guts. I ain't got that kind of whatever you call those things. Paul is off the hook here preaching what? Laser light, happy peace? Uh-uh, no, 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 no. This is the real gospel. This is a commercial gospel designed to entertain units of revenue. Here are the scriptures that tell you the works of the law will not justify you. You can never be declared innocent in the eyes of God through the works of the law. Goats and blood of animals never did justify you in God's eyes. Justification is the most fantastic thing in the world. Why? Because it means you're innocent. You never did steal. You never did rape. You were never a pedophile. You were never all these horrible things. You are now justified in the eyes of God and this Jewish system based on the law no longer is accepted by God. It's thrown out. 
The proselytes are going, they're looking at each other. This is incredible. Wait a minute. We're not second-class citizens. We're equal with Jews. We're no longer proselytes. Ooh, this is a good message, Paul. Come on, baby. Here's the scriptures, uh, YouTubers, where the old law was replaced by the new law. The old law is thrown out. Replaced by the law of faith and grace. Yeah. In America, I got everybody gets the same reaction you just gave me. Heard that before. Back then, this synagogue is, I mean, rumbling from one end to the other. These people are stunned with this information. To us, it doesn't mean much, and we've heard it so much. Eh, it was old hat. Not there. Not that day. Uh, YouTubers, here's another one. According to these scriptures, there's no such thing as a second-class citizen anymore. The Jews were God's chosen people. The Gentiles were crap. Hello? The Ku Klux Klan says we're the chosen people. Blacks are crap. Correct? That's what they believe. Jews were God's chosen people. Not anymore. What? Now we've got projectile diarrhea in the synagogue. Now nobody can believe what they just heard. I don't believe you said that. You mean, you mean those people are equal to these people in the eyes of God? Ooh. Then, unlike this system of stroking everybody till they cough up the cash and making you feel good and partying you off with happiness, peace, love, prosperity, and abundant life, boop, 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 boop. It's fun to go to church. It's fun being saved. <laughs> Yahoo! Yahoo! It's so sweet and so nice. Hit it, Billy! Boom! A 15 orchestra plowing the gospel down your guts. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to hear that song again. Boom! No. No, no. This, this horror system never, never got any play here. Now Paul is warning these Jews and proselytes based on what he just told them. Oh, these things are going bigger. Wow. How does he do it? I don't know. Must have been the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm warning you. Be, beware. Beware. There's no bewares here. It's kind of a suggestion. You go to the Calvary Chapel. Oh, no, you, know, you need to try better. No. Beware, says the Lord. Beware of what? That you don't have to pay for ignoring what I just said. And he quotes Habakkuk chapter 1. Behold, you who despise this message, you who are amazed at it. What? I can't believe that's crazy. Thomazo, you who perish, afenizo, that means you're going to get destroyed, but you don't know what direction it's coming from. You get hit like somebody running a stop sign you don't see. Boom is what it means. You're going to get hit, and you're not even going to know it, he says. Jehovah said, I will work a work in your days, a work which you will in no wise believe, even though somebody tells you about it. What does that mean? Hell was coming to the Jews 70 years later. In the form of a bunch of Romans wearing skirts. Spears and arrows and skirts, not a good combination. What's Paul doing here? It's masterful. It's supernatural. It's divine. The Holy Ghost, he can preach a house of fire. He's using historical information that they could relate to. 
He didn't get up there and explain to them how Buddha recommended they modify their meditation and sleep patterns and change their diet and sniff some herbs. No. He's talking about stuff they can relate to, the history of Israel. Proselytes, Jews, they're all on board. Brilliant. Then he goes to the present tense. Now, listen, this whole system's changed now. This is a Jesus Christ, the Son of God system now. This isn't Moses and David or anybody else. This isn't animal sacrifices. It's the sacrifice of the Son of God. Now, you can't be saved anymore. You can't go to heaven anymore. You have no hope anymore without the precious blood that Jesus shed. Now, now, if you ignore it, if you don't believe it, hell is coming to your house. You're not going to get a hell coming to your house with this whore system of making people feel good and helping them out while they donate money. But the gospel of God is not a whore system. It's not a system set up to include everybody. It's a gospel of exclusion. These who do not believe are excluded and face the judgment of God. You can preach a message like that now on YouTube and get away with it because there's nobody there. <laughs> You're just staring at a mic. Here, he's facing them. He's in the building, for God's sakes. This took power to preach a sermon like that. Real Holy Ghost power. Yes, sir. Not the hyped up stuff from the concert. Right. And then he goes to future tense. Hey, Here's the good news. You can have your sins forgiven and be justified. Here's the bad news. If you ignore God's word, his new word, not the old word, the old word's out. If you ignore this new word, you will face total destruction. See, the real gospel of Christ requires you tell people what is true, Amen. whether they like it or not. Paul wasn't looking for an offering that day. He didn't see these Jews and proselytes as units of revenue. Right. He saw them as eternal souls needing to be saved from God's wrath and judgment in eternity to total justification in Christ. Yes, sir. He had no ulterior motives like these systems do. And then he used the Bible to back him up every, every step he took. He would quote out of the New Testament. Brilliant dissertation. Brilliant sermon. That's how you do it. Yeah. Acts 13 still. When the Jews left the synagogue, I bet they did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <clears throat> I remember I was watching a videotape one time, and Derek Prince was running a deliverance service, and a bunch of, a bunch of Pentecostals got out and ran for the dope. Boom, they're gone. Pentecostals don't like deliverance. They don't feel comfortable with it. And uh, Derek Prince turned around to Pastor John Hagee and said, it looks like the Pentecostals are leaving. And they were. They were scared. The ones with the Holy Ghost ran out. It should have been the opposite, wouldn't it? No. No. These Jews bolted for the door. They couldn't take it anymore. They couldn't take it anymore. You mean to tell me that everything I believed all my life, and you mean to tell me that everything my dad believed and my granddad and my great-grand, you mean to tell me by continuing to believe that I'm going to face the judgment of God and I can't be forgiven? You gots to be kidding well, they left. Don't you, can't, can't you see the two systems? The fraud system. Can't you see the true gospel? The true gospel excludes people. They left. No one ran after them. No one ran them down and apologized. You know, I, gosh, I was too blunt there. You know, maybe I overstepped my bounds a little bit. <laughs> you know, let me kiss your fanny for a little bit. No. They let them go. Why? The gospel causes splits. This gospel doesn't cause splits. It causes chronic entertainment and long-term spiritual failure. 
Hey, the other ones, the Gentiles, the proselytes said, hey, can you come back next Saturday? We want to book you in. Don't you see it? The, the proselytes went from second-class citizens that morning to after the sermon, click, equal in the eyes of God. Why? They were justified through faith in Christ. Nobody, you are deficient to nobody in God's family. Did you know that? Nobody. Even somebody who has all the gifts. They got all the power and the gifts. Oh, they got to. In God's eyes, you are just as valuable. You are just as loved as any other person in Christianity. You mean to tell me that if I don't believe that, the proselytes move up here, I move down here, oh, that's it, they left. Couldn't take it anymore. When the congregation broke up, many of the Jews and religious sabo is a Greek word, it means people who had converted to Judaism which had, and had great ref, respect for the Torah and for Jehovah. The religious Jews followed Paul and Barnabas. And no kidding. Not going back to that synagogue. Who, speaking to them, per persuaded them to continue in uh, all the laws of Moses. Now, go check out ceremonial bathing. Sniffing things, eating certain foods, going to feasts, have a feast. That's what he told them. He said, continue in these feasts. Now, let me outline these feasts for you. There's a whole bunch of them here. Take, you, got a, you got a pen? No, he said, continue on in the grace of God. The whole system now had completely changed when that stone was rolled away from that tomb. There was, for eternity, a new sheriff in town. Acts 13 still, the next Sabbath, Paul says, hey, of course I'll come back on the next Sabbath. But when he showed up, guess what he found there? The proselytes and the believing Jews... This group here, the unbelieving Jews, left. They don't want to hear that anymore. This group here and that group there went out and told everybody. The whole town showed up. And the synagogue is packed full of people, standing room only. But these Jews that left, they went and told their family and they were angry here, and then they multiplied the anger. Right? That's what people do. If they tell you something good, um, it multiplies something good. If I tell you something negative, it multiplies something negative. Correct? Duh. Humanity. The Jews ran out madder and hornets, told everybody, now they're madder and hornets. The other people went out and told everybody and said, hey, guess what? We can be justified through the blood of Christ. Not only just once, but continuously justified. That's what this Paul guy told us at the synagogue last Saturday. You ain't going to believe these sermons. You've got to hear this guy. Nowadays, it works that way in the prophetic business and the charismatic business. That, uh, they will got to come back and hear the latest prophet. Oh, you should have heard this guy last week. Oh, he prophesied over <coughs> Barney. Barney? What? What? He's broke. He's got an IQ of a, of a goat. Oh, no. He got a prophecy. He's going to be preaching the nation. He's going to work for NASA. Oh, you ought to hear this guy. You got to come hear the prophecies that are so incredible. They're off the hook. Great. Bunch of crap. These people came back to hear the true word of God. Not a bunch of phony prophecy trying to pump people up and increase the unit's revenue. When the Jews saw the multitudes, whoops, the usual religious stuff now kicks in. Bang. This church here is the envy of all these churches now. All the churches are now watching Hillsong. Why? 
Of course, they're spreading their system in a superior manner using technology these churches are not yet using, and they're now starting to use it, and the little churches don't use it either. So everybody looks at them and says, hey, maybe if we use that technology, yeah, we can use the internet, and boom, we can really spread this thing and start raking in units of revenue. No, notice what the true gospel does. It starts a fight. When you preach what's true, it's going to start a fight because these people are not going to believe you. These people are going to believe you. There's a fight a brewing. In this system, oh, calm down. No, calm down. Oh, that's okay. You're Catholic? Oh, it's fine. No, bro, we like Mary. Come on in. You're Muslim? Oh, okay. Jesus was a great man? Okay. Come on in, have a seat here. Mother Mary, come over here, hon. Allah, sit over here. It's all good. Don't, don't get mad. Calm yourself down. The true gospel doesn't do that. Gutless and preachers and Mickey Mouse congregations do it. They like to pat your fanny and give you something so sweet and so nice. The gospel of God tells you the truth and doesn't care whether you like it or not. Now, they got mad, and they come back, and they are going to attack Paul. And Paul was coming, and they were blaspheming Jesus Christ. They were blaspheming Jesus. Is that a forgivable sin? Of course it is. Blasphemy is a forgivable sin. But, did you see Paul trying to defend Jesus, hey, you preach the gospel straight up, and if somebody doesn't like it, that's not your problem. That's their problem. So they started to attack him. Hey, that's not right. You're lying. You're misquoting. You're, what are they doing? They had all become Baptists. They were fighting over Scripture. And splitting over theology. Fighting over scripture and splitting over theology causes what? Nothing good. Then Paul and Barnabas wax bold. What? Well, these guys must be nuts. I don't believe it. Surely they would have toned it down, right? Like all these gutless pastors and losers. Oh, we can't offend anybody. We've got to be politically correct. Okay? And I get many referrals from pastors all over the valley because they want someone to hear someone who is politically correct. And so what you do is you just tone the message down, pucker your lips up. I'll show you how to do it. Bend over. No, Paul wasn't bending over for anybody. Right. He preached it harder. Amen. He said, hey, you don't like this? You're not receiving it? Hey, listen, it, that was expected and predicted. Had you read the prophets right, you get the gospel first, Jews, then everybody else gets it second. Seeing you have deemed yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Wow, that sounds like a contradiction. He says, no, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. It's not a contradiction. You have no capacity whatsoever to save yourself, and you couldn't get rid of a, one sin in your life if your life literally <clears throat> depended on it. Worthiness comes in by receiving the gift of God and accepting it as a gift, unearned and unwarranted. That makes you worthy in the eyes of God. These Jews who were pitching a fit, blaspheming and criticizing him, he said, hey, we're going to go to somebody who wants the gospel. What? You insulted those people. Ooh, that's politically incorrect. 
Wow, watch your mouth. Oh. People in hell don't watch their mouths. They're screaming day and night for somebody to come help them. They're, they're screaming to come back to earth and hear a hardcore, truthful sermon. They'd give anything not to hear another band play. They'd like to hear the truth of the gospel of Christ. They'd give anything to do it, but they never come back. They're never, they're never allowed out. They just keep screaming. Like them Jews that died and went to hell. The Lord commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles. Then he quotes Isaiah chapter 4. We are the light to the Gentiles. Oh, man. Listen, tell your rejection demon he has to leave tonight. You are the light to the nations. Ethnos is the Greek word for nations, not Gentiles. The King James people made that word up. It's actually nations. You are the light sitting on a hill that cannot be hit. You, you are a light to a lost and dying world. Amen. You thought you were a spiritual loser and a nothing and a nobody. Are you kidding me? You're priceless to God. Priceless. You're the light for salvation to the entire world. So when the nations heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. Don't you see it? Can't you see it? It's so, so easy. You preach a hardcore message, you preach the truth, you will always get a reaction twofold. This group will hate your guts. This group will agree with you. This is the group you focus on. You forgive and release that group. You focus on this one. That's how it works. If you keep kissing everybody's grass in these groups, you end up with lukewarm, carnal, indifferent, uncaring, demon-infected Christians who don't amount to a hill of beans spiritually and can't pray their way out of a wet paper bag. I don't believe the sermon. This thing sucks. No, it doesn't. This is, this is actually how God, not man, not the, not hill, not the megachurch, this is how God set the gospel up. This is how he wanted it done. Not like that. An entertainment system. This was how he set it up. You preach it hardcore, Mike. And if they don't like it, you forgive them and let them go. These people who like it, you keep helping them. That's how the Lord set it up. The word of the Lord was published in all the region. Yeah, exactly. Uh-oh, what happened? More trouble. Don't you understand? Gutless Christians and lukewarm losing pastors, they don't like something. They're all the same. See, they're all in the same group. You know what it is? They don't like trouble. They don't like it. People don't like trouble. God. Why can't things just run smooth? If you preach the true gospel, not the commercial one, you will have trouble and there's no way to get out of it. And if you don't understand that or you've been socialized in Christianity not to understand this, you need to have a wake-up call, dude. If you keep compromising your Christianity like churches do, you'll get more people there, true. You'll get greater units of revenue, true. But you'll get more lukewarm, carnal Christians there, hello, than you will if you preach it hard, preach it true, and let the chips, as Grandpa said, fall where they may. That's... God talking to you, not them. Well, they stirred everybody up. They said, hey, we're all, we're steamed here, and what we need is some people with some power. Yeah, see? Poor people don't have any power. Nobody listens to poor people. You got to get people of stature to support you, correct? Everybody wants a voucher, but they want a good voucher. Okay? Nobody wants a voucher who's the family 
goof or the village idiot. What the? Nobody cares about that. Oh, hey, you know, Brother Mike, he's a great preacher. There's, there's seven schizophrenics down there. They, they like him. Well, that's great. Nobody's going to think I'm a... They're going to think I'm nuts. Right? Oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, Doug, uh, Governor Ducey goes over there, and uh, Trump uh, flew in on his jet and drove over. You're going to go, well, wait, what's going on over there? So now they recruited some decent people, so to speak, and they attacked him. What's, what's causing all this? Paul caused it. Who, who really caused it? God caused it. He canceled the old system. And he said the new systems replaced it. And here's how the new system works. Not like that in the 21st century. You preach it hard. You preach it nasty. You preach it filthy. You give it as truthful as it is. And you let the chips fall where they may. Period. And you do not compromise it. And you don't preach because you're looking for units of revenue. That's this system. Yachts and cars and mansions. You preach because eternity is facing each listener. These left you. They died and are burning in hell. These received it. They go to glory. That's how it works. And then they stirred up the chief men of the city. And they threw them out. Oh, you don't understand. You don't understand. Getting thrown out is the best thing that can happen to you. People don't want to get thrown out. They want to be received and accepted, and they want people to like them. I just wish people would like me. I've got a lot of good qualities. I don't pass gas in public. I dress properly, and I've got a good attitude. Listen, you are not called by God to kiss people's fannies. You are called by God to save souls from eternity in hell. You are called by God to tell people the truth, whether they are your friends or not. Well, they threw them out. What caused that? God. Well, it couldn't have been all his fault. No. Paul believed God. So did Barnabas. Well, things are supposed to go good all the time. Here, that system, that's what they tell you. Oh, it's prosperity, peace, joy, happiness, abundant life. Oh, you've got it. It's all yours. Reach out for your dreams. Benny Hinn, last month, got caught on the radio telling a guy that he had gone too far with prosperity gospel. Did you hear that? I did a radio show on it. Can you imagine that? Now that's a Red Sea miracle. Somebody like Billy, Benny Hinn coming back to... Can you imagine that? That's incredible. Why is he doing that? Make himself look good. Nope. Nope. No, he's doing that. Ran out of money? No, not Benny. Oh, he can't run out of money. You know why he said that? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. It's going to, it's going to happen to each one of you. He's getting old. Uh-huh. He's like my age now. And when you get a little older, let me tell you what you do in life. Some people do. The dummies don't. But some people, when they get a little older, they start to take stock of their life. And they start to take a look at themselves and holy, shoot, what have I really accomplished? Where am I really going? How much time do I have left? Wait a minute, I'm going to meet my maker soon. See, young people don't think that the way. They're deluded. I was deluded when I was young. I thought I was going to live forever when I was in my 20s. I mean, I, you know, I thought somebody my age now was like a, a zombie. A, I crawled out of a grave. I didn't have any concept. Well, Benny's getting older, he's going, holy smoke, I'm going to have to give an account of this insane doctrine. And he's actually drifted back 
off of it. It was really interesting. So interesting, I stole it and did a radio program on it. Hey, they threw them out. If you get thrown out for doing what's right, that's a compliment. Yes, yes. It's not rejection. It's a blessing. And then how did you how did you give him that information? I didn't get to tell him all that because he started yelling two inches from my face. Started yelling at you for what? He started yelling at me. He said, "How dare you? How dare you come to me like that with this anointing here uh -huh. going on?" He said. He turned and looked at the altar. And he said, "Do you think uh, a, a couple lights are going to bother God? Do you think that's too big for God?" I said, "Certainly not." But that's not the point. And they kept yelling at me. I was so humiliated because there's hundreds of people there. And he said, you didn't come for prayer. And I said, well, I actually did. I said, I have a note, a piece of paper. Because everyone was worshiping and worshiping. But right when I got there, they stopped. It got dead quiet. And uh, I talked to a woman in the bathroom because I said, who goes to this church? How long has this life been like that? They said, a year and a half. One lady agreed with me. She says, I have your back if you're going to say anything. I never expected to say anything. I wrote it down on paper. And also asked for prayer for someone who, two friends who were in a car wreck, one might be paralyzed. Please, guy, he's doing better. But we still don't know if he's going to be paralyzed. But anyway... So I said, well, I did. It was on the paper. So, and then, so everybody heard. And talk about humiliated, deflated, embarrassed, and... Who was? Me. I was. Oh, okay. We're I, gonna, you know, you're ashamed. Someone yelling at you. Like we're going to pray for you tonight. Well, no, I'm better now. Thank you. Well, you're better now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, well, the point I was trying to make, though, before she started that story was... Had that happened to you and they got right up in your face, it's a compliment. Yeah. You take it as a compliment. You don't get all shriveled up and hurt over it. Okay? Even Elijah went to the cave after, after fighting Jezebel and was down and deflated. It's yeah. going to be shocking. It's going to be, it's going to take a step back, but you're going to have good friends around you to come and say, wow, well done, you're a Paul and a Cyrus. I said, nowhere near it, but this is the beginning of persecution. And that's what I told them when they kicked me out later. I was ministering to a heroin addict. His name's, I called you guys. I left a message about him to please help him. And that's when the guy came, and uh, they kicked me out. And he mm -hmm. ordered two men to follow me out. And I said, Lord, help me now. And no one ever came beside me. No one walked me out. No one watched me go out. So the Lord is with you. So coming here to hear this, I started crying. Thank you. Well, we're not kicking you out. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know anything about that church, so I don't have any comment to make about that. But... If the, po the point is, if Paul was making here, if you get thrown out for doing what's right, it's not rejection. And it's not something that you would be hurt over. What you should have is what? Joy, Joy of the Holy Ghost. Because you did what was right. The true gospel causes a split. Not total unity. It came to pass in Iconium, they went into a synagogue of the Jews and spoke. Oh, he's doing it again. Paul never learns. A great multitude of Jews and Greeks believed. In the other town, the Jews over here turned on him. What's the point here? 
What's the point? It doesn't matter. You just go to the next town. This person doesn't like you. They get in your face and yell at you. It doesn't matter. Go to the next guy. Right? You don't take a personal affront or offense at it. You just go to the next guy. Right? The unbelieving Jews, uh uh-oh, stirred up the Gentiles and told them a bunch of bad things about you. Yeah, and that happened to her after she left. They kicked her out. They said, hey, that woman's sick, and she's this and that and that and this. They trashed her after they threw her out, right? Well, they trashed Paul after they threw him out, and he had total joy over it. If you get thrown out for doing what's right, rejoice. That's an asset, not a liability. The true gospel is a gospel of exclusion. It's not an opportunity to make friends and influence people. This isn't a Tony Robbins gig. This is God's word. And it causes a split. It causes problems. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord. And they gave testimony to the word of his grace. Here's the the great element. You and I are not supposed to prove the gospel is true. That's not our job. In fact, I can't prove it to anybody. If you try to pull a ray comfort on somebody and use your mind, now here's a guy that's got a huge IQ. He comes up with a lot of great stuff. I watch his videos. It's all really interesting. It doesn't do any good. You can't debate, argue, and outthink somebody to receive Christ. That's not your job. The job, that's the Holy Ghost job. He touches the person and changes them, not you. He touches them and heals them, not you. What happened here? The Holy Spirit showed up and proved what Paul was teaching was true. The Judaism is out. The law has been replaced. You're healed and saved through Jesus Christ and nobody else. And that's it. And the Holy Ghost will stand by you every step of the way. Using this system? No, he will not. He's not going to stand by you and support you. It's going to be a mess. A total mess. A carnal mess. They went forth and preached everywhere, Mark chapter 16. The Lord working with them, doing what? Confirming the word. What word? The true word. The word that causes trouble. The word that causes splits. Preaching and making everybody feel good. Teaching, making them feel fine is not the gospel. That's not it. We want to make you feel welcome at the mega church. That's the main goal. We want you to feel welcome. Here's what we're going to do for you at the mega church. Look, we got these programs for your kids. Oh, they'll love it. Look at the little kids. Oh, we've got high-tech laser shows for the kidney gardeners. We teach them the Word of God. We have free schooling. Your kids are here. Bring your kids. Tommy Barnett was a master, master church builder. He's better than anybody. Not as good as Hillsong, but I'm up till here in America, he's the best. Here's how you do it to build your church up. You get a bunch of buses. (laughs) You get the buses and you travel all around the valley picking up kids. Brilliant. If you pick up the kids, a certain percentage of the kids' parents will come to your church. The kids are not a unit of revenue. They're an expense. However, the percentage of parents that come to your church are a unit of revenue. So you go out and get the kids at the bus, bring them in, 
And a certain percent of the parents will follow you in, see? Yeah. And so you got to have all these wonderful kitty programs. Yeah. Oh, super good. You got to have camels and goats at your Christmas show. Oh, but you got to make them poop first. You don't want them pooping on the stage. That's a mess. Oh, youth program. Oh, you got a young people? Young? Oh, you do? Oh, come here. Our young people go to Disneyland. They go to Space World. Oh, we've got games, video games. For, oh, they're going to love it here. You ain't going to believe it. We take trips. We fly. Can't you see this? Man, you got to be able to see it. The whole thing's a sham. It's all, all fake. Fake. Paul. No, Paul, Paul wouldn't go for that. And guess what? In Matthew 28 says, if you go, Jesus said, go and teach all nations. Oh, get them saved. Have them fill out a card and get them to say the sinner's prayer. Got it. Billy Graham taught us to do it. That's how you do it. Beep! Er, wrong. It doesn't say go get them saved. It says make disciples out of them. Mathatuo is to make a disciple out of the person. The only way to do that is to cause trouble. You cannot make a disciple out of somebody without trimming off their rough edges. You cannot make a disciple out of somebody without telling them what's true. You can't make a disciple out of somebody by doing this. <laughs> Kissing their fanny. Disciples have to be trained. They have to be disciplined. They have to learn to fail. They have to recover from setbacks. Becoming a disciple is not fun. Getting saved is fun. <laughs> Kitty save, youth group, ooh boy. Teach them to deserve to do everything I taught you. What? Whoa, we're not doing that. No. Healing? No, that died out with the apostles. <laughs> Deliverance? Oh, you must be nuts. Oh, okay, forget about it. No. Go see Brother Mike. That idiot will do it. Guess what? If you'll teach the true gospel and you'll cause trouble and you cause a split, I will always be with you, even to the end of the Amen. age. Yes. Amen. If you dumb down your message, the Holy Ghost will not anoint you. That's right. These people look anointed. No, that's all soul emotions. That's not spirit, man. Everybody's excited. It's like a football game. It's all emotion, human emotion. Hallelujah, Jesus is so great. Let's go smoke some pot. <laughs> if you preach the hardcore Christianity, the Lord will stay with you no matter what. Where do you get that? I got it right there. Matthew 10. Whoever does not receive you or your words, you know what you do with them? Okay, you take an offense, you report them to somebody, uh, you call the witness hotline, you screw them over. No, you just, and go to the next one, see? This one here got in your face. Hey! What's your problem? I don't have a problem. I'm good. You go to the next one. You mean I was doing that wrong? Yes. God wants to heal you. Let's do oh, this one received it. This one got in your face and yelled at you. Don't you see it? John 16, 1. I told you all these things so you would never become offended. It's not your job to get offended because people are pissed off at you for telling them the truth. That's your job. Amen. What? You're kidding me. 
I'm not going to do that. I want people to feel good and have a happy experience. <laughs> what? You imbecile. That is not the gospel of Christ. The gospel causes problems. Hey, these verses right here tell you that if you do the right thing, Holy Ghost will follow you and give you his power. Amen. He will anoint your ministry when everybody else thinks you ought to be trashed. Right. Back to Acts. The multitude of the city was divided. What? Oh, no. 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 Did we, did we hurt your feelings? These, these megachurch systems, they have people they send out to the person's house if they got offended and left to try to patch it up. Apologize, fix it. Why? Bring back in the unit of revenue. We don't want them going to that place over there and giving them a unit of revenue. Hmm. Some of them hold with the Jews. Some of them stayed with the apostles. Oh, that's bad news. Wrong. It's a sign you're doing what's right. A split is positive. Yes. Acts 14, when there was a salt made of the, uh, both of the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers, they decided to do what to them? Yeah. Yes, sir. Who breeds though? Listen, if the Holy Ghost is backing you up and proving what you're saying is true, okay, there's going to be backlash. You're going to have to take it from somebody. You're going to have to take negativity from somebody. Somebody doesn't like what you said. You're going to have to take rejection. Hello? And some people are going to get so mad, they're going to try to kick your face in. What do you do then? Well, you go back to the church and you claim your Second Amendment rights. You get a concealed <laughs> permit. And you start packing. And they can kiss your butt if they don't like it. You start carrying. You'll teach them. Ah, give them a piece of your mind. You're down to like two and three pieces now. <laughs> They're going to stone them. What did Paul do? Take an offense and yell at them and call the cops and then pitch a fit? <coughs> Is that what he did? Yep. Oh, wait a minute. They hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Why did they do that? Because they were cowards? Far from it. Far from it. They, they left so they could continue to save people's lives. There's a time to take a stand, and then there's a time to kick the dust off your feet, save others. You're not a coward. You're using what? The gift of wisdom. So they went to another area, and they preached the gospel. If you go to a church system, and everything is constantly positive, that is a church with the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit speaks in express words. In the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to teachings of demons. If everything is positive and happy-go-lucky at your church, you're in a demon church. If everything's politically correct, nobody wants to offend anybody, you're in a demonic group. The true gospel causes what? Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace on the earth. See? 
That's the goal of the church system, to make everybody happy. Happiness. Happiness is not from God. That's different than the joy of the Spirit. Happiness comes out of the soul. Okay? You can be happy with a sporting event, happy with a dinner, happy with a relationship, happy, 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 happy. There are trillions or billions or whoever's down in hell right now who had a lot of happiness when they were living on this earth. Now they're burning in hell. Happiness in the long run is not going to do you any good. Is it better in clinical depression? Absolutely. I wish happiness, I definitely want happiness over depression, but neither of them are going to save your soul after you die. Jesus did not come to bring peace on the earth. He came to bring a sword. I have come to set dikazo. What is that? That's where we got an English word. Dichotomy. It's a split. What? That's the exact up. God's word causes a split wherever it's preached. This group doesn't like it. This group does. It's a split. See? You preach a good sermon and you got the Hatfields over here, the McCoys over there. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with it. That's how it's designed to work. Well, that can't be. No, it's a divine appointment. If you preach a sermon and there's no split, you've preached a mouse and mick sermon. Paul went through all the goodies in the beginning, but then he switched over to the real goodies, Christ, and then he switched over to what? Beware. Hey, it's called, it's called spiritual balance. If you get too far over on here, peace, love, and happiness, you become unbalanced. Duh. God wants you to be balanced. If you preach the true gospel, it always causes a split. And it causes a split in families. And sometimes your family will turn on you. Jesus says something shocking here. Ready? He that loves his father or mother. Oops, that was mistranslated. It's the Greek word phileo, and it means to like something or be fond of it. It's not agape, love. This is absolutely shocking. Jesus is telling you that if you are more fond of your mother and father, your husband or wife, your son or daughter, than you are fond of God, axios, you do not deserve me. It's unbelievable. He that is fond of his son or daughter more than he's fond of me. Why is he using that term? People act behaviorally, behaviorally when they're fond of something, even food. Uh huh. I took my daughter to Wendy's today for lunch. <laughs> yes, sir. She said, Dad, I want a fine dining experience today. I said, Honey, I got, I got you covered. <laughs> no problem, baby. You're with me now, honey. I'm killing it. We pull into the Wendy's. I get out like I've just pulled into Buckingham Palace. You know, just walking around. Hey, what's up? Well, I went in and ordered her some stuff. 
ordered ordered me a, a McDouble, a double double, whatever they call that. She takes a bite of uh, mine, shared it with her, and she goes like that and makes a face. Well, I've been a counselor for 37 years, got a master's degree, giant IQ. I read that look <laughs> on her face, and somebody with my skills caught it right away. That was a look like, I don't like that. See? It's all here, folks. <laughs> Go home with envy. Enjoy it. Just enjoy. When you're fond of something, you can see it on somebody's face. You can see it in their behavior. It's easy to see. Okay? Where do you spend your time? Who do you hang out with? What do you do all day? Who do you talk to all day? What interests you? What are your hobbies? What do you like? Anybody can read anybody that has half a brain. Well, Jesus is reading us, and he said, listen, if, you're, if you like somebody else more than you like me, you do not deserve me. Then he says something else shocking. Matthew 10. He that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. Now this verse is taken out of context often and it's misinterpreted 99% of the time. Let me bring it back for you. You can't take verses out of context. So if you're going to look at this verse, you have to look at the context of the verses. What's the context of the verse? It's the pain of having to separate from loved ones. It's family. See that? The Greek word lumbano means to receive it. Receive what? Split the split and pain of having family members turn on you. Translation, if you can't stand the heat, you're going to get thrown out of the kitchen. <clears throat> then he says something else shocking. Anyone who finds his suke, it should have been translated soul. Your soul is where your emotions come out of. When you have a split with a family member or a spouse or a child or a sibling, there's emotional pain there. And you have to make a decision at that moment. Are you going to go with Christ and like him over your relative or your friends or not? If it's not, then you are not deserving of him. If it's true, then you have to receive that cross split. If you find your soul, you will lose your soul. Apollomy means to be ruined or be destroyed. But he says, he that ruins or destroys his own soul for my sake shall find it. That's crazy. It's never interpreted right. Everybody misinterprets that verse. What's he saying there? Look. It's going to be some, there's going to be some painful experiences in your life when you have to do the right thing. And people you are fond of or you like are going to turn their backs on you. And at that moment, you've got to sit down and make a decision whether or not you're going to go with God or go with them. Amen. And your soul, where your emotions are, that's going to be a painful moment but if you do it voluntarily you'll find your soul but if you try to keep it God your family friends you will lose your soul
hey, you know what? Your friends and relatives are not worth it. They're not worth it. Okay, we'll turn the lights on then and go to prayer. Father, there's some people here tonight that need to make a decision on who they're most fond of. Themselves, their lives, their friends, their job, their career, their recreation, their hobbies, whatever it is. And there's some people here tonight that are trying to pacify others just to keep the peace. They're trying to compromise their faith so they don't offend other people. But Lord, the true gospel requires us to do what's right. No matter what. He that tries to save his own soul will lose it. But the person who voluntarily turns it over to God will find it. Yeah. We've got some friends here tonight, Lord, that spend the vast majority of their day and their week and their month focused on themselves or their family, and they have no time, no energy, no sacrifice for you. Because of that, they can't get healed. They can't get rid of the demons. They can't get their finances stabilized. They can't get their health stabilized. They can't get their mental health stabilized. And it goes on and on and on. Over and over again. Never stops. But it's going to stop tonight. You cannot phileo like anyone more than you like the Lord. Can't do it. And if you want a Holy Ghost ministry and you want to see the Spirit of God move, you're going to have to preach the truth and you're going to have to get used to rejection because preaching the truth is designed to cause rejection. That's the purpose of it. I'm going to ask you, Lord, to forgive me right now. Those scriptures that Brother Mike put up there, he's right. He's right. There are other things I like more than I like you. There's other things I'm more fond of than you. I spend all my time, all my energy, all my money on other things other than you. And I'm so sorry. I want to voluntarily lose my soul to you. Because if I try to keep it myself, I'm going to lose it. It's all going to go bad for me. Everything's going to fall apart. The money, the marriage, the relationship with the kids. No friends. It's all a matter of time before the devil takes everything from me. It's just a matter of time. All these scrippers Brother Mike put on that board tonight, the devil knows every one of them and ten times more. He knows exactly how the gospel works. That's why he treats me the way he does. He sends me stuff to like more than I should. He sends me people I should like more than I should. He sends me stuff to do and time and clutter and cares of this life. Year after year after year. I don't want to get like Benny Hinn and go, you know what, I'm old now. I better stop teaching false doctrines. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to change now. 
I want to change now because you know what, Lord? My kids are starting to act like me. They've got the same demons I got from my parents. And now they're acting like me. That means I infected them just like my parents infected me. My kids are just like me, Lord. They're all overweight. I'm overweight. They're just like me, Lord. They're depressed. I'm depressed. They're just like me, Lord. Wasted year after year when I was young. Now they're doing it just like me. They're just like me, Lord. One broken relationship after the other. One year wasted after the other. They're just like me now. My kids are just like me. Because they got my demons. They believe my lies. Well, tonight, I'm going to take myself back and my family back. Anyone who loves their mother or father, brother or sister, son or daughter, husband or wife, more than me, does not deserve me. Now, if you're going to repent of that tonight, I want you to come up so we can pray for you because God wants to give you a brand new start. If you had somebody stuck in your face, you took an offense over it, you come down for prayer tonight because that was actually the biggest blessing of your week when they yelled at you after you did the right thing. But Jesus is warning you tonight that if you try to save your own soul, you will just see it destroyed. It will be destroyed. You try to fix yourself, you will be destroyed. You try to do it yourself, you will be destroyed. You are being called by God to preach the true gospel and let the chips fall where they may. That's what you're being called to do. That's what God's calling you to do. Thank you, Jesus. All right, close your eyes. Father God, I don't want to lose my own soul because I clung to too many worldly things. I can't do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I've changed my mind. The, the, the world may be going to hell in a handbasket. I'm jumping out of the basket tonight. And I don't care what sacrifices I have to make. I don't care anymore. I saw them scriptures, and I see the true gospel tonight. It's a gospel that causes divisions between what's wrong and what's right, between Satan and God, between me and demons. I see that clearly now, and I will never compromise my faith again, and the person I'm going to stop lying to is the person I've lied to the most, myself. I'm going to stop lying to myself tonight. Please forgive me, Lord, because I know if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just, and you will forgive me of my sins, and they are many. And all these bad men, come out of there. Come out of there. Thank you, Jesus. Come out now. Come out of there. Every ugly man. Come out right now. Just repent of it. Just repent of it. Just repent of it. There it is. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Dear Lord, save me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Dear Jesus, please forgive me now. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. Help me. Father God, I want this monster out of me. All of them. The rejection demon, the lust demons, the anger demons, every one of them, I want them out tonight in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Out, I said. 
Come out of me right now in the name of the Lord. Come out of me right now in the name of the Lord. Come out. Come out of there. Come out. I repent of it. Come out. I repent of this. I repent of lying to myself. Spirit of fear, I'm... Breathe out of your mouth. Good. Breathe like that. Good. Now use your mind and scream at that demon from your childhood. Just scream at him. I command you, you spirit of fear. Come, you come out. Come out. All right now. Every demon that makes excuses for my behavior. Every de- come out. Every demon come that makes excuses. Every pity party I have. I repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. I repent of making excuses. I repent of it. Come out. I repent of it right now. No more excuses. No more lies. Stop lying to myself. Stop making up lies. Stop listening to negative things. Stop listening to evil spirits. Tell me negative things. Come out of me right now. Come out right now. Come out. Come out. Get out of my body right now. Come out right now. Say it. Get out of my body. Say it. Come out. Come out right now. Say it. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come on. Every spirit from my husband. Come out of me right this second. Come out. Come out. Every demon in my phone. Come out of me. Come out of there. Go. 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 All the witchcraft from my family, my parents from Brazil, all of it right now. Come out right now. Go. Rejection. Come out. Low self-esteem. Come out. Low self-esteem. Come out. God forgive me. Listening to negative thoughts about myself. Criticizing myself. Listening to negative things about me. Brazil, come out. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, dear Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me for listening to the negative words about myself. Come on. Spirit of rejection from my childhood, come out. Come out of there right now. Go. Come out, I said. Just pray harder. Come out of there. There they go. Keep yawning. There he is. Here they come. Go. Come out. Come out of there right now. Go. Come out right now. Go. Come out. Come out. Get out of my son. Come out of me right now. Come out of my son right now. Come out of my son. Come out of my son right now. Get out of my son right now. I hate your guts, you rotten devil. Come out right now. Go. Come out now. Spirit of fear and terror. Come out of my childhood. Come out of my body. Go. Go. Go now. Lust. Lust. Come out. Demon of fear, I curse you. Come out of me right now. Come out in the name of the Lord. Come out right now. Test, 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 one, two. Test, one, two. Can you hear it? Yeah. Say it again. Test, one, two. Test. No. No. Test, one, two. Test, one, two. Test, one. Test, one, two. It sounds like it fit. Test, one, two. Yeah, I think it is. Testing. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. What happened to you, sweetheart? I feel, I feel new. I feel totally washed clean. 
I feel healed. I feel healed of perversion. I feel healed of molestation. I feel healed of all of that. Right now, yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Lord, just yes. give her totally 2020 vision. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Right now, in Jesus. Yes. God. Hallelujah. Wow. He wants you to give your, your testimony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to put it in words yet. It's long. Yeah. Well, he a long trip. Put it forward. Tell us. Tell us. All right. So we just delivered you from a spirit of Kundalini. You had you were talking about lower back pain right now, right? Yeah. And that spirit of Kundalini came out. Is there any more pain? Yeah. Test it. Test it out. Test it out. No more pain? No, you know, you got to tell me, girl. You better tell me. What's up? Uh huh. Can you, can you, you, can you test it out, though? Any more pain? Is there stuff you could do? Yeah? Saints of God, listen to me. You can't get spirits out of your body sitting there doing nothing, praying casual prayers. You got to step up on this thing. You've got to fight back if you want to get healed. You can't casually come to God. You can't do it intellectually by thinking about it. Come on. You are not part of the church system. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You are not going to live like this anymore. Right now. Michael, come out of your wife right now. Come out of your wife right this second. Go now. Michael, come out. Michael, come out of there. Come out. Come out. Put your hand up. Come out right now. Michael. Satan. Hey. I got news for you. I got news for you. You got to come out tonight. You got to come out tonight. I'm not going back home to Washington with fear demons. I'm not going to do that. No, no. I'm releasing my abuser right this second. YouTubers, listen to me. Put your hand on your body where your pain is. Elbow, shoulder, back, stomach. Put your hand down there. Put your hand down there. And command the spirit of pain to come out of you. Pain can be a spirit. Not in every case, but in, in many cases, pain is a spirit. Because the injury should have healed long ago, but it still hurts for no reason. That's a pain spirit. You can cast that pain spirit out of your body. If you hurt yourself and it should have healed long time ago, but it hasn't healed, that's a spirit of pain. You can drive that thing out tonight by using your authority in Christ. Come on. Right now. Satan, come out. Come out. YouTubers, have you been involved in witchcraft? Have you been involved with family that had sorcery? Witches and put curses on people. Have you been involved in that? 
Well, tonight, this woman of God is going to stand in proxy, and the spirits are going to come out of you of witchcraft and sorcery. Did you move here from another country that was loaded with demons? Witchcraft, Catholicism, those spirits have to come out of you. If you don't get rid of them, they're going to cause a terminal illness later in life. You're going to get sick. You're going to get sick and die early. You're going to get sick and die early. Come out. Witchcraft, New Age, sorcery, horoscopes, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Satan, come out. Go. Come out. Faster. Faster. Come out of her sacrum faster. Quickly. Come out of her spine. All the way out. Go. Out of her spine. Come out. Evil. Come out. Evil. Holding grudges for people at work. Come out. Holding grudges for husbands. Go. Holding grudges for my supervisor. Go. Holding grudges, come out. Hurry up. Come out of there. Go. Come out. Faster. Faster. Come out, spirit. Go. Come out of her brain. Brain stem right now, go. Every curse from her sister. Every curse. Every curse. Every spirit of adultery. Go right now. Come out. Hurry up. Come out. Go. Go, I said. Go now. Every spirit from Brazil, out. Every spirit from Brazil. Come out of there. Come out. Brazil. Brazil. Witch doctors. Healers. Demons from Brazilian healers. Go. Healers, go. Come out. Healers, go. Curses from my relatives. Curses from my mother. Mother, out. Mother, come out. Come out. Come out. Go. Come out. Out. Go. Come out. Curses from my husband. Curses from my husband in the name of Jesus. Come out. Every spirit from my husband. Right now. Adultery. Lack of love, lack of affection, lies. Go now. Everything go. Hurry up, go. Come out. Come out of there. Go. Go. Every disappointment from my marriage, go. All my disappointments from work, my career. Finances. Go. Finances. Go. All the people at work that turned on me, come out. I forgive them. I let them all go now. No more bad feelings about people. Go. Go. No more. Come out. Come out of there. 
Come out. Every one of them, come out quickly. Go now. Go now. Come out. Come out. Demons from bad men. There he comes. Go. There he comes. Come out. There he comes. Go. Come out of there. Come out of her brain. Come out of her frontal lobe right here. Come out. Hurry up. Let her go. Sickness. Come out of that body right now. Sickness. Come out. Hurry up. Go. Go. There it goes. Come out. Hurry up. Go now. Yep. Here he comes. Go. Keep going. Come out, devil. Come out of her. Come out of there. Right now. There he is. Keep coughing. Come out, devil. Spirit, come out of her. Poison. Leave that body. Poison from Brazil. Poison. Poison. Come out of her intestines. Come out of her stomach. Come out of her womb. Right down there. Come out of that womb. Hurry up. You, you pervert, come out. Pervert, come out. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Out. Get out of there. Go. Water. There it is. by the river? Was that a spirit husband? No, no. Now, when I did this, when I fasted, I understand, Lord show me, it was somebody from my family line. They killed somebody. I feel when I was taking their heart from me. I feel when they had a knife come keep their heart. They killed somebody? They killed somebody. They did that. And I saw the body. What's left in there? I still have herniated discs. I have herniated discs that affect my foot. I have bones that <coughs> that's in the wrong position, in the wrong, in the wrong to do another surgery. I don't want to do another surgery. <coughs> Since the last surgery, okay. it has been a help. Really, it's a help. Well, let's get him out then. I'm scared of infirmity. I want you to come out of this beautiful woman. Can you hear me? <coughs> there he is. Come out right now. Come out, spirit of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity, come out of that body. Right now. Come out of there. There he is. Come out, spirit of infirmity. Hurry up. Come out. Spirit of infirmity, go. Go now. Go now. What happened? I've been, I've been praying to be able to speak in tongues. Um, I've been asking God to either let me understand the language or to start speaking it myself. And my mother-in-law here, and you just prayed over me, and I felt the anointing on praying in tongues and just started letting it flow. Uh, yes, yeah, Salah say. Keep going. Keep going. Good. Keep going. 
Keep going. Hey, streamers, this is Brother Mike, YouTube. Don't forget to go to the website tonight, hardcorechristianity.com, and hit the post deliverance button. And then hit the teaching button. There's this article you have to read tonight. You will be attacked within 48 hours of this service. Satan's counterattack. Be sure you read that article. Also read the article on how Satan controls the mind. Hey, I will see you Thursday in Kansas, in Emporia, Kansas, next Thursday. Brother Rick will be here next Friday filling in for me. See you next time.